Good morning and welcome to worship at Ferndale First United Methodist Church. This is the worship service for Sunday, January 17th. It's Human Relations Day in the United Methodist Church and you have the opportunity to send in a special gift if you would like for uh, our Human Relations Day uh, ministries in this denomination. And uh, the liturgist for this morning is Blazel Gordon. We're delighted to have Blazel present with us here in the sanctuary to lead her portions of the service. A couple of announcements. We want to thank you for your ongoing support as we continue to uh, minister in this community as faithfully as we can during this time of COVID. Our online Bible study is Thursday at 3 p.m. You can join us on Zoom if you'd like. Contact Norm Kern or myself to get online with us. And today, this week we're studying Hosea chapters 1, 3, and 11. Um, one other thing I would like to mention, and that is on Tuesday evening at 5.30 p.m., people all over the country and especially churches are invited to turn on your lights. Turn on your lights everywhere, outdoor lights, indoor lights. Turn on your lights at 5.30 p.m. as a special national and international COVID memorial. There will be a time of remembering at Tuesday at 5.30 in the afternoon. So with those things in mind, we're preparing our hearts for worship on this day when uh, we, of course, remember the ministry of Martin Luther King Jr. and hear God's call to our own lives as well. And when we sing the opening hymn in just a few moments, uh, we're singing, lift every voice and sing. I have to confess before we begin worship that uh, that hymn always leaves me questioning whether white people have any uh, justification for singing that hymn, whether we have any right to sing it, but uh, our congregation has embraced all of us singing it together, and so uh, we're grateful to lift our voices together and sing in gratitude for what God has done. Let's begin worship at this time.
the greeting from Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is, is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. calls, we read in our Bible how you called people to, to greet mission or to hold actions or to speak pro prophets' messages in your name. Disciples were called. Prophets were called. Samuel heard your call in the night. Jeremiah was called and it looked like a fool 
when hardly anyone listened. John the baptizer was called and the people flocked to hear him, but it cost him his life. And so it was with Dr. King. Can ordinary people like us be called? What might you call us to be or do, God? Will we hear and recognize you? Help us to listen, to truly hear, and to act even today. Amen. Good morning, kids. Tomorrow is a very special holiday in, uh, in our country. It, we call it the MLK or the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday celebration. It's a celebration because it's a day for remembering. It's a day for remembering uh, a very brave man who uh, maybe didn't start out brave, but he became brave because he realized that God wanted him to do something very special with his life and something very courageous in our country. And so t uh, today in our worship service and then tomorrow in the special holiday, we remember Martin Luther King Jr. Um, when I was a kid, I always loved to think of, uh, um, and uh, read comic books and stories about superheroes. Superheroes were uh, pretty cool to me. But as I grew up and grew older, I, I still enjoy superhero stories, but I also enjoy stories of real life flesh and blood people who did courageous things, who did strong things, who stood up for what was right and what was good and did it in strong, brave ways. So I'm glad for tomorrow's holiday. In fact, um, I like to read Dr. King's sermons and I like to read things that he wrote. It's all very important to me. And I do that for a couple of months in the year around this time. And it just uh, fills me up with just a little tiny bit of his courage and a little tiny bit of his bravery. And so I'm glad to have this time to remember him. And <clears throat> some, not everybody understood him, and some people didn't even like him. You know, sometimes when we do the right thing, some people might not even like us. They might be angry with us or something like that. That's the way it was with him. Um, but he, he continued anyway, even when people were angry with him or even when people didn't understand him. Um, that's a good lesson in courage, too, to keep on doing the right thing and keep on walking with Jesus all of our lives, no matter what, uh, because Jesus is with us 
all these times. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for being our partner, our older brother, our, our friend, and the one who walks with us and can make us brave and give us courage when we need that too. So we're grateful for people like Martin and we're grateful for each other and we're grateful for a church where people support each other and help each other to be brave. Amen. Today's scripture from the Hebrews, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 18, reads as follows. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark, God, where the ark of the God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and, he call, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming, were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also. If you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. The word of God.
Hear the word of the Lord from the Gospel according to John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 35. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter, the rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than that. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven and earth opened, heaven opened rather, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. The the voice of the Lord was rare in those days. (laughs) Tell me about it. Some Christians are deadly sure they know exactly what the voice of the Lord is saying, what it sounds like in their ears. Other Christians aren't so sure, but they're pretty certain they know what it's not. Anyway, that's the beginning of the story. The voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Rare enough today, too, God knows. Those were dark days as are these, days in which we wonder who is really in touch with God, who has a right to speak for God, who can we really trust when they claim to speak for God, does God speak to anyone at all these days? I mean really speak, not speak with words necessarily, but really speak somehow, not just religious fakers or TV evangelists, but Does God speak to everyday sorts, people like us? The Word of God was rare in those days. But is it the Word that's so rare, or are we maybe not listening, not hearing, not expecting it to come, not in that way anyway? The Word of the Lord was rare in those days, and those are grim words when we think about it, grim words with which to begin a story. The voice of the Lord is rare 
In one sentence, that they tell us that about lostness, they tell us about fear and confusion, and they say so much. And Eli the priest is blind, he can't see, and what if maybe he's also blind because Eli won't see? Sound familiar? Eli knows another kind of blindness because he knows he's not been faithful. He knows that even with his blind eyes, he looks the other way when members of his family use their position in the country to get what they want, to get their way. And in fact, the Scripture tells us they put the whole country at risk with their shenanigans. But then there's also the word that Blazel read, but the lamp of God had not yet gone out. There's still a glimmer of hope. There's still those moments just before dawn when we have wonderment, when we have anticipation, when time, that, that time when, when our dreams are uh, real for us just before waking. And they may wake us with a start. But then there's Samuel sleeping in the shrine itself, but he doesn't yet know the Lord. How close can we be without yet knowing the Lord? And so Eli is blind and Samuel is ignorant, but God calls Samuel anyway three times until Eli finally wakes up that it is God in fact and we better listen. God's call and God's mission is way too much for a kid. It's not a sweet, loving word that he hears, but it's a hard and costly word. It's a word of judgment and worse. Yes, it's too big for a kid, but it's what it's going to take to make the country right again. At least Eli accepts it when he hears it. So what is it that wakes you in the middle of the night or maybe more likely in the wee hours of the morning, or maybe just before the dawn comes. If we listened better, could it possibly be the voice of God? What is it that stops you short in the daytime or triggers your thoughts as you walk along or maybe as you drive along and makes you think something different? Fast forward to Jesus and John, what is it? Three men standing there by the roadside on a hot, dusty afternoon. A fourth one walks by, and it seems like just any other ordinary day, but one of those three says the words, Behold the Lamb of God. And all of their lives changed that day. The two disciples of John turn and they follow this new guy, this new fellow named Jesus, and they follow him with John's blessing. John is willing to let go. No voices in the night for them, no really overwhelming experiences, just the okay of their trusted friend and teacher, John the baptizer, and they go. They walk with Jesus from then on. It's, it's the call of God that comes maybe through a human voice one day. How many ways can God call us? How often might we miss it? One of the men goes by the name of Simon, and Jesus takes one look at him and changes his name to <clears throat> Kephas, to Peter, he says, you'll be a rock. There's no taming this unpredictable Jesus. There's no telling how he might come to us, what his call might be like for us. Then there's Nathaniel, and clearly Nathaniel in this text is a bigot. There are certain people he despises, and he's smug in his own rightness, his own certainty that he has the right to uh, judge other people by who they are, what they act like, where they're from. And Jesus, of all things, says to himself, I can work with that. 
<sighs> At least you're honest. No beating around the bush with you. Essentially is what Jesus says to him. And Nathaniel, stunned by Jesus' acceptance of him, gets up and follows too. But life becomes different for all of them after that. What makes life different? What makes a call? What makes you start thinking thoughts that you had no intention of thinking maybe uh, a day ago or two weeks ago? Are we thinking differently now than we did then? New thoughts, new thoughts about life, new thoughts about your life, new thoughts about change, new thoughts about what's the meaning of it all, new thoughts about what makes a life different and maybe what is God calling me to do or to say? What makes a call? Uh, it isn't necessarily dramatic, but it probably isn't what we expect or what we plan. We're not always sure of where we're going, but we're willing to find out, to walk the way and maybe just find out day by day. Come and see, Jesus says at first. Come and see, Philip says later to Nathaniel. Come and see. He doesn't offer any kind of spiritual sledgehammer that it must be this way. It's just a simple invitation. Come along with me. Walk together with me. Give it a try. See for yourself. Life itself will teach you if you'll walk with me. You know, usually God doesn't say, forgive everybody. Instead, God invites us to forgive that certain person. That's the hardest to forgive. God doesn't just say, oh, love everybody. As good as that sounds, God, in fact, sends us to love in a particular situation that needs love. That's a call. It isn't necessarily easy. It might mean working to change what's broken in our community, in our country, in our conscience. Every week, I get in my car and drive not so very far up into the thumb area, and yet every week I feel like I'm driving into another world. I go there each week to give what little help and support I can to my parents who are uh, nearing the end of their life's journey. Uh, many of you have been there yourselves and walked that road. And I've had to, as disturbing as it is to go up there, come to the conclusion that this is my call for a little while at least because left to myself, I wouldn't choose to go to a place where if you go into the grocery store, uh, half of the people don't wear masks and some of the others that do wear masks wear them below their nose or even under their chin as if that somehow makes a difference. I wouldn't, in fact, personally choose to go to a place where their little church has had two COVID deaths already and they continue to meet in person for worship and only half of the people in worship wear masks. Recently a funeral was held in that church. There were 200 people packed into that sanctuary much smaller than ours. And only half of them wore masks. I go I go each week because they are my parents. I go, but I can't put my feelings into words. It's not that I, so much that I'm afraid when I go there. Uh, as I say, I can't really put words to it. There, there's a degree of anger in me when I go there. I, I wonder 
to myself inside the turmoil. How can people act like that? How can they think the way that they think? And, and how can they be the way that they are there? Uh, it's not that they're evil, but I'm sure there are some there that support the insurrection, the sedition in Washington. And so I find that when I hear Jesus, and I hear Nathaniel, actually, and there's, there's a little bit of Nathaniel, I think, in all of us, thinking we're the ones who are so smug and so right, so correct. And I have to con- come to the place, the, the conclusion that this is my call for a little while to keep on going, to help make it a little less hard for these two people who gave me both the good and the bad at the start of my life. I'm grateful to them, even though I don't agree with most of their beliefs, at least many of them. And so, in these days, I I watch as their flaws and their frailty and their faith and their humanity are all raw and exposed. And so it is with so many of us as the reality of an ending sets in. Sometimes God's call is temporary to do something hard or maybe even easy for a little while, to say a word that needs to be said. But somehow we know it's what we must do maybe for a time, and maybe it becomes all-consuming, like the passion of a Mother Teresa, or at a time like this of remembering Martin Luther King, Jr., whose passion cost him his life. Now, if we don't change the world or the country, maybe at least listening to Jesus can change us. Hearing a call can change us, and we can follow. God knows we need a whole lot more listening to Jesus these days. So what's a call? What makes a life different? What is it that calls to us that we have to do and it changes us? What is it that wakens you in the night and grabs your attention? What words suddenly speak to your heart or speak to your spirit or speak to your passion? What challenges grab hold of your gut and you know, I've got to follow through on this? What needs around you in this world are, thing, are places where we need to reach out as we can? We don't have to be great. We don't have to be famous What will we be willing to hear? What will we be willing to do in walking with Jesus? Martin Luther King Jr. never once denied that we would see color. Nor should we deny that. But he dreamed of a day when we could see character even above color. All of us. I'm going to invite you to watch this. Think about recent events in our country. Think about the turmoil. And I want you to remember our past because in those times too, Those were times of oppression. Those were times of violence. Those were times of chaos. And so as we look back, as we watch, I want you to watch of another time and dare to hope again. Amen.
Let's pray. Loving and patient God, we come before you today as your people who experience your call in so many different ways. And sometimes we stop our ears. Sometimes we slow our feet. And sometimes we bury our heads in the sand. But your call will continue to come to us, and we're grateful for your faithfulness to us. Even in times when we need to ask your forgiveness for our unfaithfulness to you. Forgive us sometimes for being like Nathaniel, deciding before we've ever met, deciding who is in, who is out, who is right, who is less, who is more. God, help us all. And oh God, as we come to you today, we have, of course, the needs of the world on our hearts. As the pandemic rages again, growing in so many places, growing and yet uh, seemingly able to be slowed in other places as it continues to skyrocket here. Help us, O oh God, in the face of so much need to trust you, to trust those who have spent their lives and especially in the last several months at the science that has helped us to see the reality of what we face and also helped us to have a vaccine, vaccines now that will in the future alleviate this pandemic. But for now, we need to follow you. We pray, O oh God, for uh, in our own a former church family, the Elbert family, as Gwen has died of COVID and its complications. We pray for your comfort for that family. We pray for others with other ailments and others who are in need of healing and in the process of healing. We pray for Doris Hainline as she seeks to gain strength at Beaumont Hospital. And we pray for, especially uh, today, prayers of joy and celebration for Richard Churchill coming through his surgery so well. And pray for your continued uh, touch upon his life as his back heals. But, oh God, in the midst of our personal needs, we are part of something bigger and we want to ask, O oh God, for somehow you to work within the culture of death and violence that we live in.
God, I'm stunned to hear this morning that here in the United States we have executed more people in the last six months than we did in the previous six decades. God, forgive us for placing such little value on human lives because we know or we can feel quite certain that among those people, first of all, you've not given us the right to take those lives, and secondly, among those people there were surely someone or more who was innocent. Help us, O God, to plan to move forward into a culture that is no longer focused on death and destruction, chaos and violence. Protect our leaders in the days to come as we prepare for an inauguration. We ask for your guidance, for your protection, for your help, for, their, for your wisdom, to be their wisdom as well. And for those of us here in this church and in this community, guide us to be light for those around us. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, the one we walk with and the one we pray with when we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, for a closing hymn, let us sing together the answer to God's call, Here I Am, Lord. We're singing only stanzas one and two, Here I Am, Lord.
receive now the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal love of God, our Creator, who patiently waits for us, and the peace, presence, and power of God's Spirit that will send us forth to do God's work and to walk with Jesus. May all of that and more come from God and be with us now and always. So be it. Amen.